Good morning, Trinity. Do you stand with us? We're going to do a new song this morning. It's called Joy. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. Can you say that with me? The joy of the Lord is our strength. Thank you, Jesus.
Come on, church, we have victory this morning. We have power this morning. Come on, we're talking about the name of Jesus. We're talking about Jesus' name. Jesus' name changes everything. It changes any situation you're in. There's power. That name is fighting for us this morning. He's fighting for you. He's fighting for me. So let's lift our voices. Let's declare that our God is fighting for us. Whoa, come on, God is fighting. God is fighting for us. Jesus, we have victory. We declare you are Lord. We declare you are King this morning in this place. There's no name higher. There's no name higher. I know many times, church, many times you, the Bible tells us over a couple hundred times the word remember is used. Remember. Why? Because, you know, how quickly, how quickly we forget, right? How quickly we forget what God has done for us in the past, what God has done for us yesterday. And so many times we sit in today I'm guilty of this. I wallow in my self-pity. I run and hide with my tail between my legs, and I say, just like Elijah did after he had his greatest miracle, he went and laid under a shade tree and said, God, I want to die. After he had the greatest miracle over the, the false prophets of Baal, he went and he wanted to ask God to take him home. I felt that way before many times. I said, Lord, it would be great if you just come right now and just take us all home. I've said that many times. But I need to remind myself. The Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. We need to remind ourselves sometimes what he did the last time we were sick, what we did the last time we were unemployed, the last time we were in the middle of a marital crisis, the last time somebody's child had left and then the prodigal son came back home. We need to remind ourselves because we too quickly forget how great our God is. So this morning, we're going to sing this song unto the Lord. You've done it before, God. I know you're going to do it again. You're going to do it again. Praise the Lord. Lord, you're so faithful. So faithful. Remind us this morning when we forget, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. But you have never failed me yet who can say that's true I've been waiting for change to come knowing the battles won for you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. And I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet.
because it always does. My heart will sing your praise again. If you're in that season of waiting, you need to praise him right now this morning, right here. And Jesus, you're still enough. Yes, you are. Keep me within your Your praise again, your promise, your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness. voice come on start right now. You're going to keep being faithful, Lord. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are holy. Jesus.
Let's just take this time to continue to agree and worship in prayer for the Father. This is our Fa Heavenly Father. We gather here together to worship you and only you, Father. We don't worship you for selfish reasons, dear God. We worship you because you are worthy. You are worthy of all of our praise and our glory. We don't worship for things in return, dear God. So, God, forgive me if I sins, if my prayers ever reflect selfishness, dear God. God, I pray that we're, that your spirit is never far away from us, that we draw near to you in this moment, Father. That we continue to press in to you, Father. That we just keep pressing in. We press in. That we don't get lazy in our praise and our worship. And if you just want to continue to, to give God more, just lift your hands and just thank him for all that he's done in your life. God, I'm so thankful for what you've done in my life and your salvation, sending your son here to earth in human form to live on this earth, to bear my sin, to hang on that cross for my sin. I'm not worthy of that, but God, you are worthy of that praise, Father. God, I long to feel your spirit in this place. I long to, to lay in the spirit that is thick in this room. God, your spirit is so sweet in here right now. We feel that you are here, dear God, and you've answered a prayer and a saying that I pray that your spirit is not far from us, dear God. I'm so thankful for the joy that you've put in my heart. because of the love that you've put on this earth for us, dear God. And we just thank you and we believe that you are the one true Lord, that you are healer, that you are love, that you are our glory and our, you give us grace, dear God. God, we just want to say a prayer for uh, Pastor Crabtree right now, dear God. That we've got a message that he's just, he's been really weak as of late and He's developed a virus, and the medicine that he's got for this virus has caused him to break in a rash, so he's been struggling with a cold, and he's got this rash in the virus, dear God, and that's not how you intended his body to work. You intended his body to be free of this, dear God, so we're just going to believe that he's going to have freedom from this rash, from this cold, from this cancer that is going to come, continue to draw out of his body right now, Father. God, I'm just going to visualize this happening to our friend right now, that this is leaving his body right now. God, we just thank you. In Jesus' name, in your name, Father, in your name, this is, this, these things are done. God. So, God, we just thank you that we can call upon you for this. We ask you to be with our loved ones, the people that we know that are sick, the people that we know that are lost, Father. That you bring them back, that they have no choice but to follow you, but for your spirit to be around them, dear God pray that we continue in our prayers, our selfless prayers, to, to reach them so they can be brought to you, dear God. We thank you so much. In those moments, we want to turn our eyes to you, God, only you, not to ourselves and not our actions, not our prayers, dear God, but just to you. And I pray that we are open to hear you, dear God. We're open to see you, that we're just going to continue to turn our eyes to Jesus. Let's turn our eyes to Jesus. Hey, Mike. Our sister here feels she has a, a word to share from the Lord this morning. While we were worshiping, it just came to me that I know that when we come to church, a lot of times um, we feel scared to enter in. And you may have left your home this morning, and it may be a mess because of interactions with family members. It may be a mess because, like us, you're tearing up part of your house and redoing it. You may have left with angry words, left someone behind because they wouldn't come. Um, maybe your body feels broken this morning. Maybe your heart feels broken. But I think it's important to remind everybody, and I feel like this is what God was saying, that you may even have a besetting sin that you feel guilty about. There is nothing he doesn't see. He sees it all. Nothing is hidden from him. You may think you're hiding. You may think you need to carry it because you're too embarrassed to share something, but he is here and he is with you when you're home. He was here on your way here and um, he is always with you and he wants you to know that he delights in you and he always loves you so much. There is nothing that stops him from loving you. 
and he delights in your praise. And I don't want anything to hold anybody back. I don't want you to feel guilty because Jesus died, so we don't have to feel that guilt. So remember that, that he is here wanting you. You don't have to feel rejected. Jesus fixed all that. Amen. Lindsay, will you lead us in that? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, please. What you share this morning, oftentimes if you're new to church, God can lay a word on somebody's heart for all of us to receive, and I'm thankful for a sister in the Lord that gave that word this morning. So whatever God needed to seal upon your heart, I pray that was sealed upon your heart this morning as she was obedient to the Lord. But may our eyes be fixed on Him and the things of this world, those things that you came in with this morning, man, would you find freedom in Jesus this morning? Absolutely. Well, so sorry, forgot about that bumper video. Yes, we are kicking off our hero series this morning. Yeah, and I'm starting off with Gideon. Yeah, I'm super excited about this. And y'all, I love to be with one another at church. Man, it's a place where I find support and encouragement when we are able, I love when we have worship together, when we're able to pray together, because it reminds me that we are an army for the Lord, and we are battling against the enemy, and we can do it together, not by ourselves. And so I love being with one another. If you guys um, don't know who I am yet, I am Jen Soltis. I am the youth pastor here at Trinity. Woo woo. Love our youth students. Yes, they're awesome. Um, and so they, I love being the youth pastor. Um, me and my husband, we do it together. And believe me, it is so cool to be back there with him throughout the week. But through um, every Wednesday night, too, I just love seeing these teens take their lives and use it for the glory of God. And I love seeing God work in them and through them. So it is an awesome privilege to do what I do, and I absolutely love it. Like I said, Pastor Wade and Sonia, they are visiting family this morning, and we are kicking off our new series called Heroes with the subtitle, God Can Make a Hero out of you. And so I'm so excited about this. But aren't there a lot of heroes in life? You know, that person that runs into a burning building, we would call that person a hero. Firemen, police officers, we call those people heroes. Well, I want to tell you about a young girl that I considered to be a hero. Her name is Malala Yousafzai. I think I said her right, <laughs> her name right, uh, at least last name. Malala lives in a country where they choose not to educate women, or that they don't, the Taliban rather. Her, her town um, that she lives in is totally fine with the education of women. However, the terrorist group, the Taliban, do not want women to be educated. 
So Malala, even though she knew that the Taliban did not want her to be educated, um, she still, and her family still, chose to allow her to go to school and to be educated after the age of 13. So Malala said, I want a future for my life, and be having a future for my life, I know that education is going to help me. And she did have fear. She was afraid that the Taliban were going to find out that she was continuing to get an education, and she was afraid that they would come and attack her home, to attack her father. And so despite all that, despite the fear that she had, she still chose to go to school and get an education. One day Malala is on the school bus coming home, and as she's coming home, the Taliban board the bus, raise their gun, and shoot her in the face because they no longer wanted her to have an education. Malala survives the attack. Now, I don't know about many of you, but if that would have happened to me, the fear would have been insurmountable. I'd been like, I can't do this anymore. This is really scary. What does she do? She starts a petition to allow other young girls in the face of the fear of the Taliban to continue to get an education, to go to school, to change the rules in her country, to allow young women to stop the Taliban from doing this to girls in her nation. And she starts a petition to allow girls to, allow, uh, to go to school and get an education. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that is a hero, a, a young girl that's willing to stand up and and that's why I love teenagers. She was 13 years old when she got shot in the face. And she did this. She is the youngest person to ever receive a Nobel Peace Prize. And that is Malala. That is a here. Somebody that's willing. Yeah, absolutely. Somebody that is willing to stand in the face of adversity and say, I'm willing to stand up despite fear. And I believe that all human beings have a hero inside of them to some degree because all of us, within all of us resides love for people, courage, compassion, hope, strength, humility, integrity, respect, faith, resilience, passion, benevolence, kindness, patience, joy, and truth. And do you know why I believe that all resigns in human beings, whether we choose to use that or not? It's because we are all creations of God. We all bear the image of God. And so whether somebody knows the Lord or not, I do believe that some people bear the image of God and they are able to have courage in spite of fear. But there's something for us as Christ followers. As Christ followers, we recognize not only were we created by God, but we recognize him as our creator. And so this is what Jesus says to us. When he came to this earth, he said, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to love God and love others, right? So as Christ's followers, we can't set back and not be the hero. Because as Christ's followers, we are to love God and to love others. And as Christ's followers, love finds a need and meets it. We can't see a need and let it go past us because if we choose to love God, then we have to love others, right, church? Like, we got we to gotta step up. We got to uh, face our fears. We got to step up in adversity because that is what God has called us to do. And we can't do one without the other. So this is why I'm so pumped and so excited to uh, kick off this Hero Series because God can make a hero out of you. So uh, the hero that we're talking to you about today is Gideon. So let me give you a little bit about the history of Gideon and what he is facing. Around 1208 BC, the Israelites are living in their country, and there is several nations that are coming around them, but there is one group of people that they're not trying to overtake the Israelites, uh, Israelites and take their country. What they're doing, which if you're a farmer, you would hate this. What they're doing every harvest time that the Israelites are, you know, getting their harvest, the Midianites, this nation, comes against them and starts to ravage their fields, starts killing their cows, starts killing their donkeys, starts killing their camels, starts destroying their fields. 
And this happened for seven years. So this is where Gideon, our story, um, happens today. And so this is a picture of good old Gideon and what he's facing. So he is facing this nation of Midianites that for the past seven years has basically been trying to starve the Israelites and make them weak people. So if you'll open up your word, uh, the Bible with me today to Judges chapter 6. We are going to read what's happening um, with these people and what these people cried out to God and said, God, help us. And God chooses Gideon. So we're going to start at verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Orpha, which belonged to Joash, the clan of Abazer. Abazer, I'm so sorry. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of the wine press. Now this is what... I don't know, threshing wheat, you're not going to do it in a wine press because you want the wind to blow through it. It's like, if you want to look up the history, it's really cool. But you want the wind to blow through it so you can get all your grains and all that stuff. But Gideon is hiding in a wine press from the Midianites because he doesn't want his harvest taken. So this is a scene. He's hiding in this wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. Gideon, the unexpecting hero, the least in his whole entire family, and the weakest, but God chose to use him. This is something I just want us to catch really quickly today as we look at this history and the story of Gideon. See, how God interacted with the Israelites is that God made a promise with Israel. And this was, and we've heard it, maybe you've heard the term covenant. God made a covenant with Israel. And this is how the covenant goes. You follow me and I'll provide for you. So have you heard of the Ten Commandments? Like, don't murder, don't commit adultery, right? That's what the Israelites had, plus a lot of other rules, all right? (laughs) So basically, God said, hey, follow all these things, and I will provide for you. But what had happened is that they had a judge, uh, Deborah. So for 40 years, under Deborah, the Israelites followed God, and God provided for them. After Deborah... For seven years, the Israelites started to turn to other gods. And what happens? The Midianites start to take over. They said, God, we don't need you to provide. We're going to look towards other gods. So God's like, all right, I'll back away. Does that make sense now that we understand, like, this is how God interacted with, with the Israelites during the time of Gideon? But God is merciful. The Israelites cried out to him. So God is merciful, and he shows up to Gideon. What's cool for us today And this new covenant and this promise that we have from Jesus is that God already showered his mercy on us. We don't have to do to have God show up for us. He already showed up with Jesus dying on the cross. Now all we have to do is respond. That's why Jesus says, if you love me, you'll do what I command. So it is out of love for God that we follow him. He already has showered his mercy on us. He's already shown up for us. And now all that we have to do, church, is receive that and then follow him out of love for him. Isn't that awesome? I love that. Like, I love that he showered his mercy on us. I don't know about you, but I love the story of the underdog. Like, any underdog story, you know, the football, I'm not into football. I'm like, 
the least of all my family when it comes to watching sports, all right? <laughs> like, I don't, but, so when a football game comes on, I'm like, who's the losing team here? Because I'm cheering for them, unless it's West Virginia or Alabama, all right? So, you know, so I'm like, I just want to see the underdog win. And I love the story of the underdog. I love the kid that got bullied at school and is like the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. I love hearing those stories. And Hollywood, right now, if you haven't noticed, is overwhelmed with superhero movies, all right? So if I could compare Gideon to any superhero, I would compare Gideon to the good old Steve Rogers before Captain America, right? The least in all his family, pretty wimpy kind of guy. That, to me, would be Gideon, right? He's like, hey, I'm unqualified. But what's really cool about Steve Rogers is that somebody saw qualities of a hero in him. And that's how he became Captain America. Somebody saw that he was a mighty hero, that there was something in him, and that is how he becomes Captain America, right? And so if I could compare, now it's not a perfect comparison because Steve Rogers is like, yeah, I'm the underdog, but I'm gonna take down the giant. You know, it's not a perfect comparison. But looks-wise, this is what I imagine Gideon to be, okay? So the reality is all of us are going to face insurmountable situations in our life, right? We're going to face situations where we feel like we're weak and we're the least, right? A child comes down with an incurable sickness. What am I supposed to do now? I can't fix this. Your spouse mentions the word divorce. What am I supposed to do now? I can't fix this. Your friends, they turn their backs on you. Your coworker, the most avid atheist of all, anytime you speak of Jesus, has the quickest wit and intellect to like rip you apart in two seconds, right? You're like, I am the weakest when it comes to sharing Jesus. Or lastly, what about those insurmountable things when God starts to pull on your heart, he's like, hey, I want you to go on this mission trip. Hey, I want you to be a part of this ministry. And you're like, I can't do this. I don't like teenagers. They scare me, you know, and your knees are knocking, right? Like, you, there are going to be situations in our life where we feel so incapable and so weak. But God gives us a name of who we can be in spite of who we might be in the moment. This is what I want us to hear from a part of Gideon's story. Did you notice in Judges chapter 6, if you have your Bible open, I would encourage you to go and underline it um, or highlight it. But the angel of the Lord addressed Gideon like this. He called him Mighty Warrior. At the moment, when he was a wimpy thresher, all right? He called him mighty warrior in the moment when he was being the least and the weakest. And God, can you hear this this morning? God is so fond of giving people a name to indicate not who they are on their own strength, but, who, but what they can become and the power of God. God loves to give people a name, not who they are in their own strength, but who they can become and the power of God. Simon, the unstable, scare fisherman. He was so like flippant one way, I love Jesus. I don't know who Jesus is, like so back and forth. What does he call him? He's so unstable. He calls him the rock. It was not through Peter's strength that he was going to become the rock, Simon Peter's strength, but it was because of the power of God that was going to be in him. What about Abram, the father of none? He had no children, and he calls him a father of nations and multitudes. God loves to give people a name of who they can't be in their own strength, but by the power of God, who they can be. And Gideon's humility, y'all, 
is what made him capable. Gideon looks at the Lord, at the angel of the Lord, and he says, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest of all. And on top of that, I'm like the least in all of my family. Paul, really puffed up religious leader, he meets God. And God begins to change his perspective of who God wants to use, of how God uses people. And so Paul is writing a letter to the Corinthian church. And you can find this letter um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. And Paul says, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. So if you are here this morning and you are facing insurmountable odds, you feel like you're not smart enough, you feel like you're not strong enough, God chose you for this moment, for this time, for his glory. And we're going to get into that, and I'm excited. But for his glory and for your benefit. God chose you for this moment. God can make a hero out of you. And if you are a Christ follower, I am not sorry to tell you, but it's your responsibility because we are to love God and to love others. But you don't have to do it on your own strength. You can rely on the Lord because he loves to use people that are humble. I'm so thankful and grateful that I am not God (laughs) because God chooses to look at the inward, right? Where man chooses to look at the outward. And so on Gideon, when you look at his resume, who can I go to uh, save Israel? On his resume, it read weak and foolish. Many of us question, why would God want to use a man like this? So recently, um, I heard something from somebody in my life, they were telling me, we were talking about uh, sports, and they were talking to, me, talking to me about how coaches recruit, are recruiters. Um, and so they were saying, recruiters nowadays, what they're doing is that they are looking for people that are, have a deep root of insecurity. Why are they doing this, you might ask? Because somebody that is deeply insecure will do anything to prove themselves to themselves or to other people. So they are looking for athletes that, are, that feel like they're not enough. Because what these athletes will do is that they will spend 80 plus hours a week trying to prove themselves to other people. Because they are so insecure, because they feel like they're not enough. So they will go beyond their own, they will try to go beyond their own ability and spend 80 plus hours a week. What other limits will we push to overcompensate for our weaknesses? Will we abandon our families to receive the praise at work? Because we have a deep root of insecurity. When we don't know what to do with our finances and the pressure is on, to what lengths Will we try to fix it with our own hands? When our, when our love for another, our desire for another is not meeting our standard, to what lengths will we take the matter into our own hand? And it's in these moments that I love what Paul calls us. This leader that was full of pride and puffed up, and he met God. And this is a scripture, if I could say any scripture or any word of truth that you could walk away today, is 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 9. And I love this, and I want you to really take this scripture in this morning. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. 
Who are the jars of clay? Who are these things that are so breakable? Who are these things that can, that can crack under a moment of pressure? You and me. And he is our treasure that fills us up. And if we are full of him, when we're about to be crushed, we cannot be, right? When we feel abandoned, we cannot be because we are full of him. But the moment that we empty ourselves and don't allow him to fill us up, we can be crushed. We can be broken. But thankfully, we have a God that can restore I am so, uh, I should say, quote unquote, grateful right now for this book that I got from a friend called Sacred Marriage. And I say, quote unquote, grateful because, man, it has challenged me in my marriage. It has been like a mirror to my face. But let me tell you the subtitle of this book. And every single time anyone sees this book in my hand, they're like, ooh, that's good, because they read the whole title. Are you guys ready for this? This is the subtitle. It says, what if God designed marriage to make us more holy than happy? What if God designed marriage to make us more holy than happy? Why does this resonate with people that read this book title every single time? Why did this book title resonate with me? Why does this title of this book resonate with you? right now. Because when it comes to marriage, or I'm telling you, this book has not only been good for my marriage, this has been good for every aspect of my life. I recommend it, Sacred Marriage by Gary Thomas. All right, so that's a little promo. But anyways, uh, why is that book been so resonating to me? It's because in my marriage, or any, even in my relationship with other people, The ugly monster of my sinful nature can pop its head up. It's in those moments that I can say, God, man, I'm angry. I want to do it my way. I don't want to be full of God. I want to say this. I want to be sharp. I want to do this thing. But what if I am full of God and God can use those moments to make me more holy than happy in the moment? What if I allow God to refine my sinful nature and instead of choosing to do things my way, I let God refine me and make me holy and set apart so that he can use me to better my marriage, to better my relationship with other people, to, to be the best at who he has created me to be. Galatians 5, uh, chapters, or verses 19 through 22, I think offer this perfect contrast of when we try to do things um, on our own way and our sinful nature, our nature that is in contrast to what God wants us to do, and when we do it in a way that God has called us to do. So in Galatians 5, 19 through 22, it says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, amen, selfish ambition, (laughs) dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these, right? That's how we can act in our sinful nature. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When we are full of God, that should be our fruit. And our relationships with other people, how we act in our workplace, when we are full of God, this is the fruit that people can see. But once again, you can't do it by yourself because if you try to do it by yourself, one of these ugly things will pop their head up in your life. One of these envy, jealousy, uh, this outburst of anger, you, we've experienced that, right? But when we are full of the Spirit... These are the things that overflow in our lives. 
It's in these moments that we rely on God, uh, that when we rely on his strength, that we realize that he can use us to be amazing here. So I want to read 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 9. Like I said, if you could walk away with anything, walk away with the scripture. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. So after God calls Gideon, uh, if you want to read the whole story and want to hear the history of this awesome story of how God interacted uh, with the Israelites during this time and how God interacted with Gideon, Uh, It's a really great story that you can find in Judges chapter 6 and 7. But I'm just going to go down to this part. After God calls Gideon, this is the next thing that it says. Then the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with power. So this is where I imagine Gideon being like good old Captain America, right? I think we have a picture. Yes, he went from wimpy Steve Rogers to good old Captain America because he was full of the Spirit of of the Lord. He found his strength. And so he blew his, hand, uh, his ram's horn as a call to arms, and the men of the clan of Abazur came to him. He also sent messengers throughout uh, Manasseh, Asher, Zebulon, Naphtali, summoning the warriors, and all of them responded. So if you haven't heard how many men, so I'm going to summarize a little bit more of the story. So when he sounds his ram horn, 32,000 men show up. Yay, they can go defeat the, you know, Midianites. They can crush them. Once again, God wants Gideon and the nation of Israel to be reminded that it's not by their strength that they can beat this battle, but it's by God's strength. So this is what God does. So God's directions may not always make sense to us, But he wants us to trust him, to strive to do his will for our lives. So let me tell you this story. 32,000 men show up, and God says to Gideon, Gideon, now if you go out and you defeat the Midianites with 32,000 men, I know these people, they'll be like, we did it. So because of that, I want to show them as by my strength that this battle was won. So he says, Gideon, I want you to go to this army of 32,000, and I want you to say to him, if any of you are scared, go home. So that's what happens. Gideon goes out. He's like, hey, if you guys are scared, go home. 10,000 go home. 10,000 men go home. They're probably like, thank the Lord, you are good, right? So 10,000, they go home. Then the Lord goes, oh, 22,000 still. Still, they'll think that they're too good. So he's like, I want you to go down to this water, and I want you to get uh, to watch how these men drink water. Now, the men that put, like, their face in the water and, like, drink from the water, and then there's going to be men that are going to take the water, and they're going to drink it out of their hands. So he's like, all right, Lord, let's go do this. So he's like, hey, everyone, go get a drink of water. So they go down. They go down to the water. They get a drink, and a large group of men put their face in the water to drink the water. Only 300 men scoop that water up to drink the water. And Gideon's like, yay, this is my army, (laughs) right? Like, it's crazy. So God's like, hey, the rest of you go home. These 300 men I'm going to take with me. And this is what's really cool about Gideon. Gideon is noted in Hebrews chapter 11 for becoming a man of faith. And I love this because Gideon had realized that if he trusted in God, that God was going to show up. And so I want to read the rest of the story of Gideon. So if you'll uh, go with me to Judges chapter 7, verses 15 to 22. So what happens is that uh, God had given one of the Midianites a dream. And in this dream, he was like, listen, the Israelites are basically going to overtake you. So one of the Midianites are like, oh my gosh, I'm scared. The Israelites are about to take us. Well, if he would only knew there was only 300 men, maybe he wouldn't have been scared. But all he had was the dream, okay? He just had this dream that the Israelites were going to overtake him. 
So Gideon heard about this dream, and this is where we finish our, uh, the rest of the story of Gideon this morning. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshiped before the Lord. Then he returned to the Israelite camp and shouted, Get up, for the Lord has given you victory over the many night herds. Then he said to them, Keep your eyes on me. When I come to the edge of camp, do just as I do. As soon as I and those with me blow the ram's horns and blow, blow your horns too, all around the entire camp and shout, For the Lord and for Gideon. It was just after midnight, after the changing of the guard, when Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the Midianite camp. Suddenly, they blew ram's horns and broke their clay jars. Then all three groups, so the rest, all of them, 300 men, blew their horns, broke their jars. They held the blazing torches in their left hand and the horns in their right hand, and they all shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And each man stood at his position around the camp and watched as the Midianites rushed around in panic, shouting as they ran to escape. But when 300 men blew the rams, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords. So the Israelites didn't even have to go and, like, Hack them down. They fought against each other, right? And then you'll continue to read the rest of the story where Gideon pursues and his army go and pursue the Midianites and take them over. What I also really love about this story as we finish um, this morning is that when the Israelites, there was a time in their history when they were enslaved by the Egyptians, and God frees them through another underdog, Moses, all right? Moses was another great underdog story, and God frees them from Egypt. And so as Moses leads the Israelites, one thing that God does with the Israelites when they go to um, take over other nations is that the worshipers go first. So I think about in the story of Jericho, when the Israelites want to go overtake uh, Jericho, the worshipers went f first around the city. And I'm sure this was not like a worship scene at all, but this is what I imagine. Before uh, the, the, the Israelites took over the Midianites, it was like a shout of worship to God. For the Lord, because this is what worship is. When we sing on Sunday mornings, we don't just have to leave it here, right? Because when we worship the Lord, and what worship truly is, is setting our hearts and our minds on the Lord and saying, you are worthy. You are worth it all. And that's what worship is. And so we don't have to just leave it here on Sunday mornings, but we can take it with us throughout the week, right? And we can fix our heart and our eyes on Jesus. And so before you go into battle, a battle that you might be facing right now in this moment, maybe you need to worship the Lord. Maybe your heart has gotten off that God is all surpassing, powerful, and great, and worthy, that he can do the impossible. Maybe you need to begin to worship and say, the battle is for the Lord, for the Lord. And so maybe before you go to fight and say, God, how do I fight this? Maybe you just need to recognize who he is. Maybe we just need to recognize that he is awesome and that he is great. Amen. That's what we can carry throughout the rest of this week. So church, this is my challenge for you this morning. Maybe you have been relying on your own strength and you need to rely on God again. Maybe you're starting to fill the cracks in the jar of clay because you realize that you haven't been filling yourself full of the Spirit. And He is so merciful. The moment that you ask Him, He will fill you again. And He will strengthen those cracks in you. He will restore you. And God can give you supernatural strength. So what is the battle you're fighting this morning? In your bulletin that you got, um, there's the word, the battle, and then li the line next to it. And what I would love for you to do, and what's your challenge this morning, is what is the battle you're facing? So maybe later on today, 
maybe this, this evening, before you lay your pillow, or your head on your pillow, I should say, <laughs> you write down the battle. And what I would love for you to do is to place it right here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Because what I love about this is that I want you to go back and remind yourself that it's not you who fights that battle. And then when you feel crushed, you will, be, you will not be. When you feel abandoned, you will not be. When you feel in despair, you will not be because he is powerful. So when you feel like you're picking up that battle again, you open up 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and you begin to speak that over your life and you begin to speak that over the battle. What else I love about this is that this Bible is full of God's truth of who he is. So I know that it's kind of symbolic, but I believe when you put that battle in here this morning, you're surrounding that battle with God's truth. You're surrounding that battle with who God is. And you're saying, not today, because this is who my God is. So can we rely on the strength of the Lord? And allow him to be our strength. Guys, because it's not just for his glory, but it's for your benefit. He wants to make you holy. He wants to have you be full of the fruit of the spirit that is kind, gentle, that is good. That when you walk into your home, when you walk into your workplace, that you are not bursting in anger, but you're bursting full of love and joy and goodness and kindness. Because it's for your benefit and for his glory. Glory. So this morning, I do, I feel like it would be wrong if there's somebody this morning that's here that has yet to choose to recognize God as their creator and that he can fill them uh, full of his spirit. So I'm going to ask our prayer partners. So if you're a deacon or if you're a prayer partner, if you're on our church staff, can you guys come and line up here this morning? So these are people that are up here this morning that if you've never asked God or never recognized God as your creator and you've never said, God, I want to be full of you. I want to rely on you. I need you to be my strength. They are here to help you to ask God to forgive you of your sins, what we call in the church salvation. Right, They are here to help you walk through that and to say, this is how you can make God the Lord of your life. And so they're going to be up here to pray for you. So right now in this moment, if that's you, please, 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 before you leave this morning, if you want God to be the Lord of your life, if you want God to save your soul because you've been relying on your own strength, meet one of them up here and they would love they would love to celebrate with you finding God as your Savior. But I want to pray for all of us this morning that we would recognize that God is our power and that we can rely on him. And I want to pray of your battle in the name of Jesus. His name is greater. His name is stronger. His name is more powerful. Amen. So I want to pray for you and for your battle this morning. And once again, if you need extra prayer, these people are here for you this morning as well. But let me pray for you uh, this morning. And then these awesome, awesome people are here for you as well. Jesus. God, I thank you so much that we can rely on you. God, that you fill us full of your spirit. God, that when we cry out to you and say, God, God, I'm weak, I'm frail. This is just recognizing who we are. God, that you begin to fill us full of your spirit. When we say, God, we trust in you. We trust your plan. We trust you that you can do an amazing work in our lives if we would just recognize who you are, Lord. So, God, I pray right now, Lord Jesus, if there's anyone here this morning, God, that has been feeling the weight of the burden of the battle, God, God, that they would give that to you today, Jesus. God, that they would once again say, God, it is yours. It's your battle to fight. God, I pray, Lord 
Lord Jesus, God, God, that you can make a hero out of them, but not by their strength, but by your strength alone, Lord Jesus, God, that you make heroes out of us, Lord. And we're so thankful that you make us a part of that, Jesus. We're grateful for that, Jesus. So, God, I pray over anyone that's dealing with um, struggles in their marriage, Lord. God, struggles in their finances, God. God, I pray for anyone, God, that's, God, dealing with uh, things in their workplace, and their schools, God, with their friendships, Lord Jesus. God, will we rely on you for strength? God, that your name is greater. God, we pray against sickness in the name of Jesus. We lift up our pastor, our uh, pastor Crabtree to you once again, God. And we say that the battle is yours, Lord Jesus. And we believe you for healing in his body. God, and we believe you for healing across, God, the sanctuary this morning. We love you, Jesus, in your awesome name. Amen. I'm so grateful for all of you. And like I said, please make your way, Mike, or we'll have um, music going on that you guys can come up here and pray. But I hope you have an awesome Sunday. And if you guys are not going anywhere for lunch, our missions teams are going on a trip. Please go over.